the email out. It's like, this is perfect. You know, I can really share all my ups and downs and how I started with teaching. And I took a few detours, but I'm back at teaching and most importantly, teaching teachers. So I cannot explain to you, you know, this is kind of like a dream job. So I put a lot of effort and a lot of information that I gathered throughout the years. I'm the first generation teacher in my family going to grad school. My mom, she obtained her bachelor's degree. Um, my dad did not finish his degree, but I was the first one going into graduate school. So you can imagine there were a lot of ups and downs, but I'm here, I'm here and I'm still here and I'm here to give back. So I just wanna get started um, and I'm gonna let you know from the beginning, I mixed a lot of different pathways just because my journey was so unique. And I felt like if I were to left out any of the pieces, I'll, it'll be unfair to you. So if I get you confused, take a note, write it down because eventually I'm gonna ask Ask, have you ask questions because I guarantee you, you're gonna be overwhelmed. It's not even a doubt that I'm not gonna overwhelm you because I'll be overwhelmed. If I was a student and you give me this much information, I'll be overwhelmed myself. Luckily, throughout my journey, I found different uh, mentors that provided me this information and supported me along uh, the way. So first of all, I wanna make sure you're in the right workshop, you're not in a different uh, professional development session. Today, we are gonna be discussing how to make a career change and move into teaching and alternate routes into teaching. And I'm even gonna bring the global perspective into today's uh, meeting, which is something quite unique. It was something that I wanted to do, but unfortunately at the time that I learned about it, my pathway was already mid-career. So it would have been a little bit hard to incorporate the global teaching into my specific career. So. First thing I want um, to do, I want you to just take a look at uh, my journey, my academic experience. I'm not gonna go you know, uh, line by line, but you could see I have three different degrees and amongst these three different degrees, there's a lot of different subject matters. And I think that's one of the reasons that makes me unique and equip me into becoming a professor at a very young age. I consider that I've, came on board very young. I believe I was age 23 when I started teaching at the college level and I did not plan for it. I'm not gonna lie to you. I just wanted to teach. I wanted to know what uh, at that point match internship, which I'm gonna be talking about today, what they were looking for in an instructor. What do they want? What do college professors need to do in order to start working in higher education? I applied and little did I know I was selected. And 15 years later, I'm here talking to you about the program and the benefits that I gained uh, from it, okay? So here it is, you know, you probably, you know, looking at floater here, zero to four years old. So when I was in my preschool career, um, I wanted to know, I wanted to try different ages. So I just asked the director, hey, you know, I know I'm in the you know, classroom for the four years old, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but if you need me any other day, I could easily float from all the classrooms. I don't mind that. And that was a great experience. I discovered that I cannot work with the terrible twos. <laughs> I do not do uh, the toddler room, uh, the infant room. I cannot do it either. So infant and toddlers is not my strength, although I love them, but that is something that I discovered here. Okay, you could see there's some babysitting. I also tried that, that was great. Uh, I tried study abroad program, so we'll get into that a little bit later. I was actually able to uh, lead programs to uh, Spain, uh, just recently to Italy, but earlier in my career, I started with Argentina, Dominican Republic, and so on. So let's move on. Question, are you able to see my screen? Yes, it's great. Okay, you're able to see my PowerPoint. Great. I just don't know how nice you could see it because I cannot see it myself. So I apologize if it's not pretty, but if it's not um, clear. So here it is. So today's workshop, we're gonna divide it in three different sections. We're gonna talk about career phases. Why are we gonna talk about career phases? Because I think this is important into making a decision 
on what you're going to do in regards to teaching, just because there's so many options. You know, most of the time people say, oh, I want to teach. But wait till you hear all the different places where you could potentially teach. Okay. Um, good thing is that these will adjust to the, whatever career phase you are. And I'll walk you through these today. The second session is going to go into professional development and how professional wow, to development be. could potentially position you prior to getting a job or it could easily make you just more attractive to make that career move that upward mobility that so many people talk about right or advancing your career or advancing uh, your position potentially for retirement right because that's one of the reasons why people move up right you probably heard that when you retire, one of the things that is considered into your compensation after retirement is your last salary. And that's the reason why many uh, colleagues decide to pursue higher degrees before they um, uh, retire or at the beginning, like myself, you know, I went straight bachelor's, master's, doctorate. I took a little pause in between my master's and doctorate, but that was about it, more of a traditional uh, route you will say so the, the last part is going to talk about you know the journey itself now that you're here now you're like okay i want to go into teaching and this is what i want to do what do you need to do you need to build your confidence and you need to do things that are probably not necessarily learned in your academic program these are things that you probably learn through family through friends to colleagues maybe even your current employment these are the different aspects that are going to play a role into hopefully leading you to a successful teaching career. Okay, so this is what we are going to be talking today. So now you've heard a little bit about myself. You heard about what we're gonna be talking in today's uh, workshop. And I wanted to know a little bit about you and we will not have enough time to have you all participate. So I'm gonna give you a minute or two so you could um, use the chat, right? And question is, why are you here today? And I want you to write your current job, preschool teacher, high school teacher, social worker, you're in retail, you're a case manager, you're a social worker. And what's your academic preparation? Do you have a high school uh, degree? Do you have your AA? Do you have a BA? Do you have a master's degree? So at the end of the day, your chat comment is going to look like this one right here, short and sweet, because I'm going to actually uh, glance through it. And I'm probably going to hide myself so we can really focus now on the PowerPoint presentation. Let me figure this out. So go ahead. I'm going to be uh, looking at the chat right now. Yeah, I see students, special education. Camino College. Have some people at the four-year college. See some in students from East LA, Cerritos. So it looks like the majority of you are students, which is great because that means that my presentation is really tailored more towards students. So let's move on. Okay, yes, yes. Okay, I see some individuals that are probably ready to make that leap to a graduate school. I see individuals with CVEST, AA, all right. Okay, early childhood education, bilingual, case manager. Wow, so much experience. So broad, I love it. Okay, see some in home experience. All right. All right, so are you able to see this next slide that talks about career phases? 
Yes. Yes, okay. So when we talk about career phases, I would say majority of you are probably in the exploration route. And this is typically pre-employment. And this is typically learned through family, through friends, even through teachers. Then after this, you are in the establishment zone. This is your entry level. It's typically varied. For example, in my um, case, when I started teaching, I started working with a federal government program. And this was a third grade classroom. Right after that, I started working at a special education classroom at a private school. Right after that, I started teaching dancing to girls that were three to five years old. After that, I started, I think, tutoring um, through the office of uh, DSPS with special needs students. Then after this, um, I moved into mid-career. And in my mid-career, I will say this is when I was mostly in preschool, I was working at the Associated Student Children's Center at Cal State Northridge and probably familiar with the child development centers. Most schools have a child development center. Like I know at ELAC we have one, at Mission College we have one, Cerrito College we have one. We have many of them. And that's where I started to work and that's where I did the floating. And at the time I was a, an exchange student and I learned about the child development permit, which I assume some of you are probably familiar with the program or probably benefited from the program. So my, uh, my director at the time said, you know, Janice, there's this, you know, permit that we would like you to pursue and we are willing to pay the fees and pay for the extra units. Uh, why don't you join it, right? So at that point, I'm established. I've established trust with my employer. I established that I am wanting to move forward and wanting to stay in the field. So now they're investing on me. All right, so that's the establishment. Then uh, I move forward. I wanted to pursue a higher degree. I've noticed some of you have your early childhood education master's degree or are thinking about it. I was already credentialed at the time as a primary education teacher. So I was multiple subjects, but you know, in California it's multiple subjects. So I was in that route, but in the process I learned about the child development permit, and that's my mid career. Why did I decide to pursue this degree? Because it was offered to me, it was easy access. It was a win-win situation. My students were gonna get a uh, better teacher, better methodologies. And on top of it, I was gonna get an incentive. I don't know how many of you know, but these incentives are, I think at the time they were about $2,000 per class if you were employed at a state uh, child Development Center, I can't recall. This was, I don't know, 15 years ago. Uh, but this is mid-career. Now I'm benefiting from belonging to a specific group. And this is probably where a lot of you are also are right now. You're like, I've been doing this job for X amount of times. I'm ready to make a career change. So just like you here, I was also intrigued. I wanted to make a career move. And that career move was also motivated by wanting a higher salary. <clears throat> so at that time, I remember in the classroom for the, let's say it was the three-year-old room, there was this um, lady that will walk in to provide specific services to, a, to a, one of our students. And I started to wonder, what is this person doing? Why is she coming in the uh, classroom? And that's when I learned about the regional center. So you've probably heard about the regional center before. So I use my teaching experience to apply for my mid-career job as a case worker with the regional center. Was I into teaching again? Yes, I was. I was a case manager, but guess who was doing the parent support group? I was doing the parent support group. So still, even though I'm a case manager following my teaching pathway, and I think that's what I wanna make the most clear today, that you are in charge. You are in charge of your uh, journey as a teacher and, and you have the, the, the tools 
to decide how are you gonna go about it as long as you don't lose your north. Because sometimes you may feel like you're like, oh, but I wanted to teach and look what I'm doing right now. I'm at a doctor's office writing programs to teach to teaching families how to eat healthy. You're still teaching. You're still imparting knowledge. You're still empowering others. And I think that's uh, the one thing that as educators, we need to keep in mind that we may take detours, but at the end of the day, if you look deeply inside, you're still making a change in someone's life. And I think that's why most of us are in the field. So this is your uh, mid-career. A lot of the times here is when you start reflecting um, about balancing, you know, especially for teachers, right? We work before we go into the classroom, we work after we get out of the classroom, we work holidays and so on, right? And this is when you start to reflect and try to, you know, balance things out, which I find myself, I've been able to learn about this balance through professional development, just learning new skills to make my job more effective. Then we have another category and that is your late career. And then in your late career, this is when you have climbed your hierarchy. So this is probably for some of you that are in child development, you probably started with your child development permit um, teacher's assistant, and you probably became a teacher and you probably moved to, I think it's a site supervisor and then an administrator. Haven't looked at this in a while. But the end, at the end of the day is you, you climb that hierarchy of your field of study. Now you feel accomplished. Now you're probably ready to start joining boards, joining professional organizations, even presenting conferences to help other teachers. And you're probably thinking about a second career, which is another category of students that I frequently get. You know, Miss, I've been a, an accountant all my life, but I really want to teach math to high school students. So here I am, okay? Uh, so that's uh, where that happens. And then um, this uh, decline of your career, and this is again, kind of goes hand in hand with your late career. And this is where you're starting to think, you know, what am I gonna do? You know, I, want, I don't wanna stop teaching. Most teachers don't wanna stop teaching, right? So you probably see these individuals starting to volunteer at the local libraries or even becoming college professors. We're gonna talk about that, right? We have some chemistry high school instructors that retire from high school or even elementary, pursue their master's degree, and then they're teaching a class here and they're at the college level and that's completely okay. So here is uh, the career phases and I'll send you the websites where I grab kind of um, all these resources. To tell you the truth, I was pulling resources from everywhere because um, this is kind of like a career services type of uh, conference. So I'm really pulling the pieces together to give you the best I can into answering your questions and sharing different um, paths. So we have the traditional path, right? So we talked about this at the beginning, you graduated high school, you moved to the community college and you joined a bachelor's program because most teaching uh, careers require at least a bachelor's degree. We have the returning student, which I will say number one problem that I see with the returning students is that sometimes the credits expire. And this is gonna depend on the college or university that you attended. And then the second career that I just um, have talked about. Most of the time, the second career students know where they're going, know where they want. They just need mostly academic counseling to get from A to uh, B. Then here I have a video that I wanted to share with you. Let me see if I'm able to. Okay. Are you able to see this new website that is called Teacher Preparation Programs? Not yet. You're still seeing my PowerPoint? Yes, you may need to unshare and reshare.
So now are you able to see these uh, California Community Colleges yes. teacher pipeline? Yes. Okay. All right. So let me show you a short video. And the reason I'm showing you this is because I just don't want to show you single subject, multiple subjects. I really want you to think broadly because, again, I don't know where you're going to end up. I just want to make sure you have all the tools. So let's look at this teacher pipeline video. No sound. Sometimes when we share a video, if there's sound, you will click a box to share the audio. So if you stop sharing and share again and click a box to share audio, it might be better. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, I think you weren't able to hear the, um, there was no sound in the video, right? Correct. If you share your screen, do you see a box to like optimize sound or to share your sound? I gotta say, I'm so happy you're sharing that video. <laughs> When you so share the screen, I'm sorry, when you share the screen, you can click on advance and then you can have the audio that come from your PC to be broadcast to us. Okay, I see that. I see the advanced option now. At the bottom, you see that you can select the audio that come out from your computer for us. You have to select that. who can start sharing so i don't see an option for sound you may want to reshare it again and look for advanced button okay i do agree i think you have to stop sharing and try again okay thank you for your patience um, yeah no when i click advance it's just coming up as us to unmute Let me try not, it gave me an option to ask to unmute. I'm wondering if that will do it. Let's try it. If not, I'll come back one more time. Are you able to hear it now? No. No, okay. Someone asked in the chat if you're using earphones, because maybe that is not an option unless you go to advanced. Or maybe it's at the left bottom corner of the screen if you're using the earbuds. I guess understanding or appreciation for the it's working. We have sound now. No greater challenge. There is a greater and greater opportunity. There is no greater challenge. There is a greater and greater opportunity than to teach. Uh, the work that I do every day allows uh, young people to find a pathway towards the future that maybe they thought wasn't possible. Uh, I was inspired by Renee Newell in uh, El Camino College. I took a welding class of hers, and she was such an inspirational teacher that it uh, inspired me to take a uh, welding internship. Once I taught, I didn't want to stop. We need people who have hands-on, real-world experience to be able to give these students a better, um, I guess, understanding or appreciation for the industry. Uh, the ability to affect a person, an individual, 
on a day-to-day -day basis by teaching them a new skill um, is incredible by itself. But uh, you know what I learned from them in the process uh, is invaluable. You know, when they paint their car and it rolls out of the spray booth for the first time, they're so excited and it's just contagious. And being part of a teaching team at a college has allowed me um, access to training that I wouldn't have been able to afford before. So I can work with uh, the folks from Tesla or the folks from Toyota or Honda in their research and development department where I would never be able to make those kind of connections. Uh, the advice that I would give somebody who wanted to become a teacher, you know, uh, go after it. Make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort uh, to get done what needs to get done to get there. To prepare to become a teacher, I am currently working in the field. I have about one year left of experience that I need and my uh, Associates of Science degree in Engineering Welding uh, dual major, which I should be done with in the next year. It is a tremendous feeling of renewal and energy and engagement when we provide our students those OHA moments that, I get it, oh my gosh. So we are um, back at the presentation. So you could see that um, pathway for career and technical. And I want you to know that that is also one of the areas that we offer at Los Angeles Community District on their match program, which we're gonna uh, further discuss um, later on. So now we've gone into career phases. And if you don't know where you are in which phase you are, and you are attending college, I strongly recommend you to make an appointment with the Career Center. They have counselors that specialize in this area and are willing to help you at any stage. I had uh, the counselors at ELAC, they have even done what we called uh, practice. Uh, it's not coming right now to my head, but what's the name of uh, when students, uh, mock interviews, that's the word. They mock interview my students. So when they go to the actual job interview, they are ready. You know, they have practice. They know what questions they may ask. They know how to really um, highlight their strengths and be ready to address some areas of weaknesses. But they got that chance to practice at the college level. So that will be my recommendation when we're really talking. Anytime I mention career, I always mention career uh, center because they are my best friend when it comes down to helping students getting a job. And I guarantee you, if you're attending a community college in California, there is a career center. If you're attending a four-year college, there is a career center. And I strongly recommend you to use them before you graduate. Why? They will charge you after the fact. At least at the four-year college, they will charge students. You can still see a career counselor but they charge you what they call an alumni fee. So for example, I know at season for me, it was $75 an hour if I wanted to talk to a career counselor. I believe the community colleges um, do not charge at all. So you have that benefit in California that you could um, use the career centers at no charge. They sometimes even have a different test where you can uh, express what areas you're more inclined towards or what areas you're definitely not inclined or not a good match with your likes. So contact them, they're great. And then in regards to familiarizing yourself, what programs are available in your area that are related to your career? And why do I mention that? Because today I'm gonna use two different programs as an example for becoming a teacher. One is in West Los Angeles College, right? That's more towards, uh, northern area of Los Angeles and they have a grant. They have a grant where students get additional funding and additional supports if they were to attend West, um, West LA College, I believe. Then I'm gonna show you another program um, in Cal State Northridge. I don't know if they have a grant right now. I was not able to find anything, but they have a program, but they don't have a grant. I'm gonna show you East LA College. They have very unique programs they don't have a grant at this time to transfer, but then they have other programs. So 
Very important, familiarize yourself what programs are available in your area to help you in regards to which phase you are really on. At the time when I was finishing my bachelor's degree, it was the child development permit where I was getting my fees refunded and a stipend for taking these classes. It is also important to know the prerequisites or the amount of units that you are going to need in order to make this career move, this career change, for example. I have some of my students that are child development happen to take two nutrition classes and now they want to teach uh, mothers, incoming mothers in regards to nutrition, breastfeeding, and they wanna work for a week. That's okay if they wanna go and work for a week, but if they don't have the six, six units that the week requires in nutrition, then they will never be able to get a job. So very important for you to be informed from the very beginning also to declare their major. A lot of the students start attending college and in their head, they know they wanna become a teacher, but they don't declare that major. They don't meet with that academic counselor to uh, you know, make that final decision. And sometimes that's how you miss out in incentives and programs. Because if we receive, I don't know, $200,000 to provide training, or for example, here at ELAC, we have a specific uh, pot of money to provide tutoring for students in math and English, specific for child development. How do we know who to contact? Because we pull students' name and their majors declared. So if in your head you are a child development major, but it's not declared, then you missed out of this great opportunity. Does that make sense, everyone? Yeah? Yeah, do you all have uh, your academic programs in line? I hope so. Okay. So let's move on. Career phases. Any questions? I want to take a pause and um, know if you have any questions. I know there is a lot of um, of you, or maybe if you want to uh, type a question in the chat right now, and I'll address it. Last comment I see on my end is from uh, David. I can hear it now. Thank you, David, for letting me know that you could hear uh, the video. No questions? No, pretty clear? Okay. No? Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So teaching pathways. So for teaching pathways, you can select, you probably heard at the beginning, I said that I actually worked in all, every, actually I, I never worked at a charter. I never had a chance to work at a charter but I worked at a private school and I work at a public school. Never had a chance to work at a charter. When I was uh, pursuing my degree, one of the first questions that they asked, and this is during my bachelor's degree, remember my exchange year, I was a, a student from Puerto Rico attending Cal State Northridge to complete my multiple subjects. That was actually my major. In that process, remember, my employer said, Janice, why don't you join child development? And I'm like, that sounds like a great idea. And I could explore other areas that I wanted to explore because at the time I wanted to study the holistic child from preconception all the way to death, right? Which is uh, the gerontology side of my degree. But the reality was, that my heart was in special education. And you're probably now like, whoa, she likes everything. Yes, I did at the time. I just wanted to help. And I think that the fact that I had so many different um, interests is what actually helped me in moving in my career um, very fast, I will say. I was able to finish my bachelor's degree, start presenting conferences, state level, national level, and then suddenly I was just getting hired as a, you know, as a faculty, which was, you know, at the time, uh, I was shocked. I was also a substitute teacher for a while, but that didn't last. I was actually pulled into a full-time uh, position right away. You could also do after-school programs, and I'm going to share something with you that actually shocked me in my uh, journey. 
I recall when I was uh, completing, I think it was my master's, my doctorate, I can't recall, but I decided to apply for an after, after school program. And believe it or not, this after school program, and we're talking 10, 15 years ago, was paying approximately, I wanna say 22 to $30 an hour. I wanna say more $30 an hour. Imagine that, 20 years old making $30 an hour. That was a lot at the time. So do not underestimate uh, the power of after school programs. And this was actually to teach Spanish. That was um, the class that I was teaching for the after school program. Another pathway that you could pursue right now is to teach older adults. And I'm going to uh, revisit this a little bit later when I show you uh, the minimum qualifications to teach at the community college level. So there are older adults, right, where you have adult schools over in the K-12 system. But most recently, we started adult school at the community colleges. And this is also another route that you could potentially explore if you want to teach older adults. So look at this. How lucky are you? So many options, and we're not even halfway. You could choose a great level. So I talked zero to four, right? That's the child development permit that got professionalized. And probably the majority of you are in that route right now. You can choose to teach with a BA, with a bachelor's degree. You can teach adult education with a bachelor's degree, or you can get a credential and then start in the public system. Or you can pursue a doctorate and teach. And then you're probably, okay, with a doctor, what can I do? Well, you can teach. You have two different options. You can stay at the community college level. And I would say that the big misconception about teaching at the community college level is that people think, oh, if I have a master's in education, I can teach at the community college level. Not really. And I face this every year. Every year we receive over 250 applications from teachers that want to teach at the college level, but they don't qualify. And the reason that they don't qualify is because they don't know the minimum qualifications. The minimum qualifications say, if you want to be a chemistry professor at the community college level, you need to have a master's in chemistry, at least. And there's some other options. I'll go over it today a little bit later. I'll ask a few of you who probably are thinking about teaching at the community college level. And then we'll look at the minimum quals because it breaks my heart because I could see the path. I could see that resume. Oh, it's a perfect, it's beautiful. I want this, I wanna hire you, but I can't because you don't meet minimum qualifications. So I'm not gonna lie, every semester my heart gets broken every time I review match applications, which is the reason why I volunteer to do this workshop today. So this is in regards to we're here with the doctorate. So we talked about the community college level, right? You do not need a doctorate to teach at the community college level. Now, if you wanna teach at a four-year college as a full-time instructor, you need your doctorate. It is required. And the difference I will say, you know, plain and simple, at the community college, you have to do a lot of community events community service, a lot of the things that really engage in the local economy and serving your local community. Most individuals that get a teaching job at a four-year college have to publish books, have to do research, be involved in grants and so on. That I would say is the uh, difference. Another pathway is homeschooling. And I actually have a few friends that have homeschooling agencies and they are doing fine. A lot of the times they, assist the parents of professional athletes, uh, celebrities. So athletes, uh, for example, I had, I was homeschooling a, a golf uh, player. He had a very busy schedule uh, throughout the year. So he could meet his uh, obligations with the Olympic team. So I will just uh, travel and homeschool him um, online and just meet every now and then and it was quite interesting not gonna lie because I had to be very creative you know teaching geometry with the golf field and so on uh, for those of you that are in Los Angeles that also includes celebrities uh, so for example I know the Jenners uh, were homeschooled I 
happen to uh, be familiar with the uh, agency that they used. And then some students that have special needs. So when I was a case manager at the regional center, some of my clients were medically involved to the point where they could not assist uh, the actual school setting. So then the teacher will come to the um, home and do the uh, teaching at home with the parent. We have another uh, pathway, and this is a little bit less traditional. And these are day programs, and these are mostly special education programs. And I'll give you some of the names that I can uh, remember. I had Pathways, um, let me think about another one, Tierra del Sol, Easter Seals. These are some of the day programs um, that I remember. There's many, many of them in California. Again, I want you to remember California is so rich for education. That is the reason why I moved. You know, a lot of the times you hear, oh, you know, stay within, you know, stay close to your home so you can finish your education. I have mixed feelings about that because in my case, right, every single research paper that I was reading in special education was coming from California. And I wanted to be the best teacher. So what did that require for me? That required me to move. Am I happy that I moved? Yes, I am so happy that I moved. I feel that I'm exposed to the best of the best in academic programs in the nation. Because in California, we have something that is called the Lanterman Act. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Lanterman Act. If you're not, you may want to take note of it and read. But this is basically the law that regional centers follow. And I always like to make emphasis of the regional centers because they are a really big employment force for California. They receive, and don't quote me because I haven't looked at the numbers in a while, but I recall when I was an employee of theirs, they received the third largest budget in the state. So you can imagine the amount of jobs that these individuals offer on a regular basis, okay? Including their programs because they are the ones that fund day programs. So this is great if you're planning to go into special education and you can afford to take online classes or night classes, you could potentially have a job at a day program. Most of the day programs happen to be early, seven to one, seven to two, it really depends. But a lot of the times they're very flexible with their hours. So if you're testing the waters, if you're thinking whether or not you want to go into special education, working on a day program may be a good option for you. And how can you do this? You're like, well, how do I learn about these programs? There is a guide called the Rainbow Guide. They have a lot of different resources in the city or potentially contact your local regional center and see if they have a list of day programs. A lot of the times they also have a library for parents and the community. And just let them know, hey, you know, I'm thinking about becoming a special education teacher, specifically serving autistic children or cerebral palsy. Um, you know, could we meet? Could, could we have a chat? And most of the time, if they are available, they probably say yes. Okay, so that's for day programs. And then, you know, we can go in depth because then they have day programs that are specifically for autistic, then they have specific programs that are for behaviors, they have day programs that are for older adults, they have day programs that are for teaching independent living skills, you name it. There's a whole other word that goes all the way to ICF, where ICF are called, in, in, what's it called? Intermediate Care Facilities. And there are actually the agencies that have children that are medically involved, but cannot be at home. So it's a little bit higher care, but they're still entitled to an education. So don't forget that. That's the one thing that I want you to keep in mind when we're talking about special education, that you can receive education in any setting because it is a right that they received. And I believe there was a really good workshop yesterday um, that I attended. And that's probably what you see that I'm really going to focus on careers because I know this conference has been so great that they are including specific 
workshops to address specific areas that I would call gaps, such as special education. And I know you received a really good workshop yesterday about special education and rights and so on. We also have online tutoring and that probably increased during pandemia, right? I've noticed a lot of the universities offering online tutoring, even um, having college students offering tutoring to K-12 students. That's another option. We have Peace Corps, and this is the one that I've mentioned earlier uh, today that I was um, uh, referring to that I learned a little bit too late in my career, right? And this is where you could actually uh, go abroad and study. So let me see if I can share uh, the website for Peace Corps. Okay, so here, are you able to see the uh, Peace Corps website now? Yes. Okay. So here you have, you know, how to become um, a volunteer, the different countries, and most of the time it requires you at least six months. Yeah, you have different countries. So let's say, let me see where I'm familiar with. Let's choose Central America. So here we have, let's choose Mexico, which is really close to us. And then you have the amount of volunteers, the language, and how to contact them about opportunities. So I like to, when I'm dealing with these type of programs, tell you the truth, I like to email for two reasons. Calling internationally could be expensive. And email, it kind of gives me a track record of my conversations, okay? So this is Peace Corps. And there's a bunch of different programs like this, but I think for teaching, this is the one that is the most appropriate. And is the one that most agencies uh, mention as being an equivalent. And why do I mention that? Because in California, there was some legislation that passed a few years ago where there are actually different pathways for you to become a teacher from the non-traditional section. So let's look at this. All right, so we're back to teaching pathways. So we just went over Peace Corps and then teaching abroad. I actually are familiar with these teaching abroad programs. I have one of my close friends who signed up to teach in Thailand for two years. She, uh, she was teaching English and for her, she loved it. Uh, she gained experience and then she came back to California and I believe now she opened her own uh, agency to homeschool and, and tutor um, uh, children. So I'm familiar with programs in Thailand and Philippines and typically you sign a one or a two year program. Uh, they guarantee you a home uh, where to live and they guarantee you a salary, but you have to be committed um, to complete X amount of years. And then lastly, a project match, which is uh, how I became a college professor. So I wanna share this website with you. And I'm also gonna go over minimum qualifications because I also promised you that I was gonna share this with you, considering that this is uh, the number one mismatch when people is wanting to become a college professor. So let me go into their website.
Okay. So here we have um, the match program. And you could see it's been going on for 30 years and you're probably, where have I been? Why I never heard of such thing. Uh, but believe it or not, it's been around for 30 years. And currently in my department, the child development uh, department at ELAC, say it's 11 of us, 11 full-timers. And out of the 11 full-timers, we have Rokia, we have, um, who else? There was another faculty member, myself. And uh, I think that's two of us. So I wanna say, you know, that's a good number for being higher full-time that came from this department. And part-timers, oof, I cannot even think about it. Stacy, and I wanna say maybe six more uh, teachers that are or have gone through much program. So it works. People get higher either as full-timers, as part-timers. So I strongly recommend you if you're thinking about it, uh, familiarize yourself with it, make sure that you meet the deadlines as you could see here. Uh, the program opens November 1st. So it just opened and it closed uh, March 11. There is a stipend that you received. I'm not sure right now how much it is. I remember at the time when I participated, it was $800. Yeah, and it's still $800 uh, for you to learn. So that's quite nice that you're actually getting the tools that you need to be a college professor. But on top of that, you're getting money. And it's designed for, uh, for working, okay? So it typically occurs during the summer, five to 10. And then after you complete that program where they teach you, you know, how to write a syllabus, uh, classroom management. Right now, a big component of that is equity, distance education, getting Canvas certified, all this good stuff occurs during the summer. Then during the fall semester, they pair you up with a faculty member where you learn the hurdles, as I will say, about teaching and the good and the bad and the not so good and the very rewarding stuff. And then after this happens, you have a graduation. And then a lot of the times you're hired for the spring semester. If there is a, um, a position open, uh, you do have to go to the regular application pool. But the good thing is that you already have some experience because you've been uh, co-teaching already for half a semester. And that's the idea. Uh, behind the program is to allow individuals that don't have experience at the college level, but will like to start teaching at the college level. So these are the types of paid teaching experience that will not disqualify you. So if you've taught preschool, K-12, adult ed, you've been a TA. If you've taught not for credit courses or corporate education, you're still good to apply meaning that you can participate. So here we have eligibility requirements. So even though you are not hired as an instructor, you're required to meet minimum qualifications. So let's look at that. Let me see if you're able to see this because it's gonna be a pop-up. Um, Okay, are you able to see this um, new screen commission on teaching credentialing or no? Yes. Okay. okay, so this is not it. This is basically for individuals that have their transcripts from a different um, country or a different state. I wanna show you minimum qual. So you see, it's even tricky for me. So oh, here we go. For example, let's say you wanna be a child development teacher at the community college level. We're gonna to go to this book. You can see it's 92 pages. And then I'm just gonna take a shortcut and then I'm gonna type child development. So here we go. 
So here we have this big chart that says that for child development, you're gonna need a master's degree, but there's also an option for a bachelor's degree and professional experience. And I think that's about it. And then he's asking me to look at 32, page number 32. So let's look at the specifics. Here we go. So child development teacher. So according to the state, you need to have a master's in child development, early childhood education, human development, home economics, family and consumer study with a specialization in child development, early childhood education, or educational psychology with a specialization in child development or early childhood education. If you do not have that, you could have a bachelor's degree in any of these disciplines above and then meet any of these criteria here. Let's go to a completely different discipline. Let's go to an area of need. One of the areas of need in California is uh, chemistry. So in order to teach chemistry at the community college level, you need a master's in chemistry. So even though you had your single subject credential to teach at the uh, high school level and you receive your master's in education, is not gonna allow you to teach chemistry at the college level. And I think this is the number one misconception for most uh, college professors at the community, le community college level at least, which is where most of my experience is. So I really hope that you can make good usage of this um, handbook, okay? I think it's uh, crucial if you're really wanting to make that leap sooner or later. Because remember, I said at the beginning of this presentation, you are in charge of your career pathway. Therefore, there are a lot of different resources, but it's really up to you. How do you use them to your benefit? And how do you embed them into your pathway to make sure that you still have that balance in between career, family life, and personal life? I wanna make sure that this is also clear. You need to have a balance throughout because teachers also get burnout. Teachers, social workers, really anybody in the human services field. And it's crucial to have this balance because otherwise there's gonna be nobody left to serve this population that needs us dearly. So let's go back now, you know, of the program. So here's everything, how to apply. And this is the website you're gonna see. It's just like you're applying for a job. Okay. All right, so let's move over um, to the next slide. Any questions? Let me look at the chat. I see a few comments here. Okay. okay, so now in order to be part of Project Match, you don't need to be at a specific school. And I know probably your question is rooted from the credential program, because I, I recall that the, for the child development permit in order to get the stipend, I had to be at a specific school, not for project match. For project match uh, participation, you just need to meet the uh, qualification to whatever you're going to teach. So for example, I am Janice Velasquez and I have a master's in family consumer sciences and I'm interested in teaching uh, anatomy. Uh, no, it's not gonna happen, Ms. Velasquez, because your degree is in family consumer sciences. So even though you feel strongly about anatomy, the state says you cannot teach anatomy. So make sure that in that cover letter, when you apply for Project Match, you've done your homework. You know what you have, you know the experience, 
if you require your bachelor's degree or any prior education to be convalidated, that's the first link that I touch and they also provide it on their website. So make sure that when you apply, your credits are clear and your cover letter is clear that they match the minimum quals. Okay, let me look at the chat for more questions. I see that the uh, link for the book was attached to the chat. So if you're interested on it, go and grab it. Okay, all right. So let's uh, move to the next slide. So why pedagogy? And I was gonna um, show you a video uh, today. I don't know how many of you watch uh, the video uh, from uh, Every Kid Needs a Champion. If you're not familiar with it, I'm gonna send it to you and, and I really hope you enjoy it. This is the video that I watch over and over. I, I just love the passion of this um, educator. She comes from a family of educators and she reminds me so much of uh, Mr. Escalante. <clears throat> For those of you that are not familiar with uh, Mr. Escalante, he is actually uh, from our community in the East Los Angeles area. We actually have a program at ELA called the Escalante program. And she is a champion, you know, she's uh, one of those educators that is truly empowering you and letting you know that we need you. We need you in the field, we need you committed and, and we need you informed, which I think it's what really makes a great teacher, which is the reason why I bring professional development into this conference today. So just remember this picture um, uh, when you receive um, the email and, and watch this video, please, please is the only thing that I'm gonna ask you to do after uh, we finish this workshop. I just wanna have a little bit more time to show you some other resources. I did tell you that I was gonna overwhelm you, right? I did not lie. So why pedagogy? I don't know, why pedagogy, you tell me. For me, it was I just wanted to help people. I wanted to empower people. And I would say it's probably the most rewarding career uh, I've had. I've been a case manager. I've been, I don't know, you name it, summer camp teacher, volunteer, teaching at the college level. Oh my goodness. <laughs> when I received this LinkedIn um, uh, request and I see students that I had five years ago are already done with graduate school or they're now hiring my current students, you know, it's, it's nerve wracking. It's, it's, it's just a good feeling. But you need to be aware that at this time, going into pedagogy, going into teaching is a challenge. There are a lot of changes that are happening. Luckily, we're getting funding, you know. Luckily, the field is professionalizing and the current needs are being addressed, such as equity. I think this is a gap that we really needed to close to really get students from point A to B providing different pathways for individuals that really want to teach and have the experience but did not know how. I think this is unique to California, unique to the laws and programs that we have such as guided pathways. And you can see, what does this mean right now, right? So you could see enabling technologies. We saw this coming, we just didn't see it coming so quickly, right? With the pandemic, suddenly we're all experts. Suddenly we all have few laptops, right? A few mouses and ready to teach anywhere. So reflect on this. Is this something that you feel attracted to? Because this is where we are. And a lot of the times we wanna do things but we don't know what it takes, right? I wanted to teach scuba diving. I did not know that it required me to carry the air filters that are like 80 pounds and I'm 96 pounds myself. So guess what, even though I wanted to teach scuba diving, I don't think I can do it, not right now, okay? So be aware of this. Uh, I also have the link where I got all these little snippets from and I'll share this with you eventually. Let's move to the next one. So your beliefs, your actions, your pedagogy. Here is basically me taking you reflect a little bit into this chart. 
what is the purpose of education? What are you truly trying to do? What's your role as a teacher, right? And you didn't hear in this uh, uh, YouTube video that she shares, there were you know other teachers that said, I just got paid to teach. I didn't get paid to be liked or to understand the student. And oh boy, do I love her answer. How are you gonna treat students and manage their behavior? Are you gonna be an informed teacher? Are you gonna be aware of the different supports? Are you gonna be familiar with the regional center and say to that mom or that dad, I am experiencing this in the classroom. Should we do something about it? Should we get additional support? Should we get a diagnosis? And I've also heard throughout this conference that you're all experiencing how parents resist that label and how at the end of the day, teachers have to deal with it in that process, right? That is not necessarily one that parents want, but it's a reality that teachers deal with. How are your students learning? Why are your students learning? Are they excited about what you have to teach or they don't have a choice? What are the best way to teach these students? Are you actively engaged on professional development? Are you having these conversations with parents? Are you having these conversations with your other teachers? How is this process happening? Because teaching is ongoing, it's invested, it's hardworking, but once again, it's rewarding, it's very rewarding. So at the end of the day, how do you assess your students on the way they learn? And at the same time, meeting state requirements, which if you're in child development, you probably experience how these state requirements continue to increase. And you have to balance, right? What you think it's important. And at the same time, meeting state requirements. Same for professors, same for K-12. We all have to report. And I think having this cycle of continuous assessment and improvement is only gonna lead us to a better future and a more uh, prepared um, student population ready to embark into whatever the new jobs are going to be, whether they are technology, robotics, STEM, arts, entrepreneurship. It's all gonna come from continuous improvement and it's up to us teacher. It's up to, it's up to us teachers how we want the students to look at us and how that relationship it is going to develop. So I mentioned this briefly at the beginning and we can go on and on into this area. I am going to uh, take you briefly to this website just because this is uh, quite complex, just because there's so many options. We have different types of alternative teaching and licenses in California. That's why I added this state here so you understand that it's specific to Janice, California. Yes? Um, are you sharing a slide deck? We're still seeing the East LA website. Okay, no, I'm sharing my, I'm sharing something different. I'm sharing my PowerPoint. So let me stop sharing and grab it again. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. that better? Yes, thank you. All right. So here's uh, the different types on alternative to teaching licenses in California. So you could do this through a university and internship program. You can go through a school internship program. You can do this teaching at a private school or at Peace Corps. Remember that I showed you Peace Corps earlier is because as I was preparing to this conference today, I continue to bump into Peace Corps. So if you're interested in this, make sure you get the nuts and bolts because it looks like it's possible. And it's new, this was not, you know, back in the day, Peace Corps, you used to do it, yada, yada. You got the experience, but not to get a license. So I think this is quite impressive. It is very nice. 
And then there are some requirements for alternative certification. And like I said, if I, I could present a whole hour in this slide, which I'm not going to, but I'll share um, the website with you. Let me see if I could share it. No, I have 16 minutes. Uh, I'll probably come back to it if I have time at the end and I'll show you how to navigate this. So your journey. Now we're gonna talk about you. Now you have the resources and let's kind of start wrapping things up. One of the first things you can do if you're not too sure, ask a teacher you admire. I can tell you right now, for me it was Diana Cruz, Diego Berrios, and Scott Plunkett. These were my teachers that I would look up to and say, I wanna be like you, I wanna dress like you. Believe it or not, I'm still good friends with all of them. I still go back to them every so often for advice. As I said, this journey never ends. You face new challenges, you face new opportunities and nothing better than going to someone that you think you can look you up to. So this is how you can start. Ask that teacher how they started their journey, why they pursue their journey, and look at their resumes. I remember till this day, <laughs> the first time that I looked at uh, Dr. Scott Plunkett resume was 14 pages. And I remember I said, Dr. Plunkett, but all along, I've been hearing that your resume should not be more than two pages. And his answer was like, yeah, that's right. When you're entry level, I'm like, oh, okay. Now I know that, right? And now I look at my resume and I'm like, oh, Dr. Plunkett was right. This resume just keeps growing, all right? So I just wanted to share that with you because that's also another misconception, especially if you go into teaching and you go into college career. You want to add your grants, your publications, your collaborations. So your resume is not going to be two pages, and that's okay. But your resume needs to match the job that you're applying for and how you're going to enhance that. So this right here is the uh, video that I wanted you to watch uh, from Rita Pearson, Every Kids Needs a Champion. The education that you're going to need, so first step, Figure it out, ask somebody that is already a teacher, see what inspiration you can get from this instructor. Further your education, decide whether you're gonna um, go to a traditional school of, or a cohort. I think cohorts are great. It just depends what works for you. And there is a few cohorts. I know at East LA College, I think they had a national cohort and a Pacific Oaks cohort. I'm not really 100% sure because most of my teaching is in family consumer sciences. I don't do the child development. Consider online programs. And I would say when looking at online programs, look at the quality of the program. And what do I mean by quality? How many students are graduating? What's the passing rate? How many are getting hired right away? And look at the price. I know back in the day, they used to be more expensive because it was kind of unique. Only certain school had fully online programs and they will take advantage of that and hike their prices. But right now with pandemia, it looks like we're all online. So that problem kind of solved itself. Look at certifications, Teach for America, Teacher Corps, Fulbright, it's a program that I actually recently started to work maybe two years ago, and it is great. It's under Homeland Security, and they have uh, just different programs that could potentially prioritize you, and that's why I wrote here, um, could prioritize you in the future. For example, students that participate in some of the programs are considered federal employees, and then if there is a job opening with the federal government, they'll get priority even though they were never an employee. They were just a student participating of a specific program. And this is actually really good for bilingual education, which is actually, I think, one of the presenters mentioned yesterday that is one of the needs in California, specifically in Los Angeles, bilingual education. 
Fulbright has a few good programs that could potentially open the door for you. And then I went um, over the match LACCD and that's for uh, teaching at the community college level, specifically LACCD. But I wanna also mention that I had students that participated in the program. They were not hired with LACCD, but they were hired, for example, from Mount St. Mary's College, or they were hired at Pasadena City College. So this internship is actually just something really good for your resume and could potentially get you hired somewhere else. It's just like an internship. And I know, I believe Cal State Dominguez Hills and Pacific Oaks, they have similar programs. The difference is that you have to pay. You have to take like a three unit class. And then as part of the class, they'll match you with a faculty member. We match LACCD, you are selected. I'm not gonna lie, it's a little bit more competitive, but you get an incentive out of it. So find your path comes with a lot of information, networking, what's available, what can I do? And really getting the nuts and bolts in writing because that's the only way to guarantee that you're gonna start in A and you're gonna end up in B. Otherwise you'll take these detours, changes are made and you just prolong your graduation date or possibly meeting your career goal. This is another small video that I wanted to share with you. I'm not gonna share it just because I wanna have um, questions at the end. But this video goes over the different pathways that we have at ELAC. Uh, we are under the social and behavioral sciences uh, department. I'm not going to show you the video, but I'll share with you our programs. Are you able to see these right now, the website itself? We see your ELAC social and behavioral slide. Okay, perfect. So you could see here the different pathways under the department that I'm currently uh, teaching. We have the associate teacher not certificate. seeing the pathways. See the list of educational and child development. Oh, it's a slide. Can you see it now? Yes, I believe we are seeing that. Okay, great. So you can see here we have the teacher certificate one. And the good thing about these teacher certificates is that they are attached to the permits. So if you complete the requirements, you're automatically completing the requirements for the permit. The only thing that you have to do, I understand, is your hours, 50 hours or whatever it is that the specific permit requires. And I want you to know that these certificates get updated so frequently. We have a very active um, faculty <clears throat> that are always changing and trying to figure out how to really align with the current jobs that are available around our campus. So here's this at the community college level. Let me show you the website for the Cal States. Are you able to see the Cal State uh, website now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, so and we just we have, have a few minutes before we'll be switching to the next session. So here we have the Cal State Apply for teaching credentials. So I strongly recommend you to start with your state resources and slowly move to your local resources. Are you able to see my PowerPoint now? Still seeing Cal State. Website. State. Okay, so let me go back. Never shared so many screens before, I think. They're all good screens, too. All right. So, uh, again, uh, wrapping things up, uh, your academic preparation is going to be crucial. You should probably uh, consider this when looking at a program. I mentioned this um, earlier, but here you have kind of like spelled out, looking whether the program is accredited or not, 
if it's a good fit for your hours, program reputation, and we briefly talked about this, right? Passing rate, licenses, employability. For teaching, I am really strict when looking at uh, a practicum or field work. Really ask what that experience is about. A good program should give you enough time for you to go into practice, allow you time to reflect, and then tie it all up with discussion. So make sure that you look into your student teaching because I think that's crucial when graduating because he's, you never taught before. <laughs> you really need that role modeling and that discussion. So just look into this if you're looking into academic programs. Reciprocity is something that we're gonna look, you know, maybe down the line if you're thinking about moving and so on. Uh, for example, New York has reciprocity with over 30 states. I know there's also some credentials where you can teach nationally. I know one of my good friends, uh, Nicole, she actually obtained that credential and she could actually move anywhere in the United States and can start teaching no problem. So again, there's options. Professional development. You can obtain this through your employment, professional organization, nonprofits, government agencies. So for example, I recall I completed the child abuse minded at reported training. I completed the lead, uh, no, led uh, training uh, back in the day when it was a big conversation. And I was able to do this online free of charge, received a certificate, was able to build, build, boost my confidence was able to move uh, forward into making my resume one that was definitely gonna get picked by my next employer. And we're all required to do professional development. I know my colleagues over at the Child Development Discipline currently doing cultural responsive teaching, PITC, First Five, Distance Ed. And you probably recognize some of these pictures that I have here because they are related to child development. At the end of the day, the more professional development, the more likely you are to be hired. Be aware of your external support, financial help, state grant. I mentioned the West LA College have a state grant at the time. Libraries sometimes have loaners for books. Yeah, Associated students also have at times uh, resources for students. So do not um, ignore this one. So this is a picture of the West LA uh, program and you could see they have guest speakers, book loans, field trips, and they are covered by the grant. It is important for you to boost your confidence. How do you do this? Through awards, getting um, recommendation letters, publications, leading a club, adopting a board position, and this is really something that we often forget. And how do we do that? Get a professional portfolio, start putting everything in there, start collecting that. And little do you know, at the end of the year, you'll be proud of yourself. Because a lot of the times we do this naturally, right? We're just natural learners. And we forget, we forget how much we've done in a year. So I always say, even if it's a good email, even if just print it out, put it in that folder, it doesn't have to be uh, you know, organized all the time, just once a year, just make sure it's there in one place. Are you ready? What's your attitudes? Are you open to possibilities? Are you flexible? Are you meeting prerequisites such as GPA, such as sometimes even a zip code will qualify you to a program or disqualify you for a program? It really depends. And lastly, employability. Are you meeting your minimum requirements? Do you have the education that it takes? Are you CPR, are you fingerprint? And why do I mention this fingerprint? Often students want to go into fields that because of life, often criminal records, they cannot work with children. So it is important for you to have this self-check. And this is a tough area to talk about, but I have to bring it up because imagine you pursue you go to school for four years and at the end of your career, you cannot get a job. Highly disappointing. So just you know, be aware of these uh, little things. Make sure you have good references. Keep up your networking, flexible. And we are running out of time. We have one more minute. 
I think these slides I already went over at the beginning of the uh, workshop. So I apologize, we are running out of time. Maybe we'll have a follow up. This was really a lot for an hour and a half, but I hope that you were able to at least get you more curious about some of these topics and interested into pursuing a teaching career. Thank you so much on behalf of Teach for LA Regional Collaboratives for this wonderful presentation, the recording. And if you share your slides um, with us, we can post to our website right away. It'll be available on the Teach LA and CCTPP website. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. We'll get you a lot of this information, wonderful slides uh, and recording for your review later. Thank you so much to Janice. I really appreciate it. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Uh, hopefully a lot of you can join the 2 p.m. sessions. There's two opportunities to choose. I'll stop the recording now since I'm going to head over to one of those sessions. So thank you, Janice.